So the purpose, the goal for today is to do 13 portion, which is the theorem of Mazur and Tate. No elliptic curve over Q has a rational point of order 13. So this was the one prime order that Mazur's method missed because X013 has genus zero. Uh, okay, so some notation that I'm going to be using today. Uh, I'm going to write X for X113. So we're trying to show that that curve doesn't have any rational points except for the cusps. And uh, J is going to be the Jacobian. And these will always be over Z adjoin 1 over 13. We're never going to need to consider it in bad characteristic, but we will think about it integrally a little. Uh, K is going to be the field obtained by adjoining 13 roots of unity. And K plus its maximal real subfield. And I'll write G for the absolute Galois group of Q. So I want to start by going over some basic facts about this curve x113. Okay, so let, let me recall what the moduli problem is. So y113 parameterizes pairs EP, where E is an elliptic curve, and P is a point of order 13. So X113, I don't think we've actually talked about. So this parameterizes pairs EP, where E is a generalized elliptic curve. And P is a 13 torsion point. Uh, such that the group that P generates hits each irreducible component of P. Remember when we were doing X0, we had a condition like that for the cyclic subgroup that it was supposed to meet each irreducible component. So this is the analogous thing. Uh, and so there's a map from X113 to X013. It takes the point to the cyclic subgroup it generates. Um, and you can compute by the genus formula that the genus of x113 is 2. The genus of x13 is 0. So if the genus of x113 were 1, then it would be an elliptic curve, and there would be kind of methods for getting at its rational points. If it, and finally, many you should be able to see that in various ways. But since it's a higher genus curve, it's a little harder. It doesn't sort of map to an elliptic curve either. So you know, if x0, 13 were an elliptic curve, you could find, you know, so they did have finally many points and then use that to get the same thing for x1. But there's nothing like that here. So you have to kind of deal with x1, 13 directly. Over here? Yeah, this is 0. OK, so let's talk about the cusps. The cusps are the points represented by the generalized elliptic curves. Oh, and this x113 is actually the scheme. I mean, it's a fine moduli problem. Whereas x013 is only the coarse space of the actual moduli problem. Okay, so x013 has two cusps. Uh, one of them is a one gone. Uh, so the associated group looks like GM, and the cyclic subgroup is the group of 13 roots of unity. And the other one is a 13 gone, and the cyclic subgroup is just Z mod 13 hitting each component. Mm -hmm. 
And so over each of these two points, there are six points of x1, 13. Uh, so to give a point lying over one of these points is just the same as to give a generator for the group, order 13 group. And there's 12 generators for a cyclic group of order 13. But uh, EP, the point EP is isomorphic to the point E minus P. So two generators get identified. So that's why there's only six points in the fiber. So the points uh, over this guy are rational. Because each point in the subgroup is actually a rational point. I mean, you can think of the 13 gun as 13 P1s, and the Z mod 13 is just kind of one in each component. Uh, but the points over this other one are not rational. Because there, to pick a generator, you have to pick a root of unity. Well, not exactly a root of unity, but one up to this plus or minus one action. So they're actually defined over K plus. OK, so there's 12 cusps. This is the conclusion. 12 cusps on x, 6 are over q, and 6 over this bigger field. basic thing we need to know about x is uh, it has this group of automorphisms that's important. So z mod 13 z star acts um, just by scaling the point. So a in here acts by taking ep to eap. Uh, so minus 1 acts trivially for the same reason I said over there. And so that implies that we get an action of the quotient, which I'm going to call gamma. And that action is faithful. And you can see it's faithful by checking that it acts faithfully on the cusps. <coughs> right? I mean, there's six elements in gamma and six rational cusps. And uh, for an element A here, I'm going to write gamma A, the element here. So there's also, uh, so you remember on x0, there's this adkin lenner involution, which quotients the subgroup and then the new gamma 0 structures by taking the image of the full n torsion. So you'd like a similar kind of adkin lenner thing on x1, but you get stuck if you don't make a choice, because if you just take the subgroup generated by your point and kill it, there's no natural point on the quotient, right? I mean, you can, there's a whole bunch of points. But if you pick a root of unity, then you can take the image of the point, which has the they pairing with the original point to that root of unity, and that gives you something. So if you pick zeta in mu 13, a primitive root of unity, and you have another the curve EP, the point P of order 13, then there exists a point Q, a 13 torsion point, such that the they pairing I guess is E13 of P with Q is equal to this fixed zeta. And this Q is not unique, but it's unique up to translation by P. And all you can do is add multiples of P to it. And so that means that we can take uh, E mod the subgroup generated by P, and then the image of Q. And that's a new point on X1 and 13. And you have to, I mean, a different definition works at the cusps. So this gives us a, a map, which I'll call tau sub zeta from x to x. And for the same reason above, uh, tau zeta agrees with tau zeta inverse. So you can define this, I'll let gamma prime be the set of primitive 13 roots of unity. 
module of that identification. So this is how zeta makes sense for zeta in this quotient set. OK, so there's some relations between the little gammas and the little taus. These are easy to verify. So if you do gamma sub n times tau sub zeta, that's the same as tau sub zeta to the n. Uh, you do tau zeta gamma n tau zeta inverse, that's just gamma m inverse. And furthermore, each one of these tau zeta squares to the identity. So these relations should remind you of something. They look like a dihedral group. If we let delta be the union of gamma and gamma prime, this shows that this is a, a group that's isomorphic to a dihedral group of order 12. Okay? Uh, the group G, remember this is the absolute Galois group of Q, acts on this group delta by moving roots of unity around in the usual way so through its action on mu 13. And uh, that action is compatible with the action on x1. Um, so right, both the Galois group and delta act on, act on uh, x q bar, and g also acts on delta, and these actions are compatible in the obvious way. Um, these, these actions here are not necessarily defined over q. Another way to say this is you can think of this Galois action on delta as giving delta the structure of a group scheme over q, right? a finite tau group scheme over q. And this is just saying that the action of delta on x works rationally if you treat it as a group scheme. Are there any questions so far? All right, good. So now we need to go over some uh, results of Og about the cusps and what they give you in the Jacobian. So the next two results are due to him. Uh, so I'm going to write pi for i between 1 and 6. I'll let these be the rational cusps. And so their differences, if you think of them as divisors, give you points on the Jacobian. So the statement is that for i not equal to j, this difference as a point in the Jacobian has order 19. And furthermore, all these differences generate the same cyclic subgroup. All right, so I'm only going to sketch the proof of this because it's pretty computational. So you remember when we were doing the proof of Mazur's theorem, we had to show that in J0n, if you look at 0 minus infinity, it had order n minus 1. And the way that we did that was by taking, you know, constructing a function and looking at its divisor and getting some relations. It's the same idea here, but there's more things at play and it's more complicated. But here's the basic idea. So for uh, a number a between 1 and 6, define this series e sub 2 comma a. That's the sum over integers n and m, where n is congruent to 0 mod 13, and m is congruent to a mod 13, and you do 1 over mz plus n squared. So this is a weight 2 Eisenstein series for gamma 1, 13. And you know, weight 2 Eisenstein series are kind of funny. They're usually not modular forms. Um, but it turns out that the difference of any two of these is a modular form. So I'm going to call those differences phi ij e2i minus e2j is a modular form of weight 2. For gamma 113. 
Okay, so since it's a modular form of weight two, you know how many zeros it should have. It's just some degree computation. And you can compute at each one of the cusps, the first two terms of the Q expansion, and see that it has the correct number of zeros at the cusps. So all of the zeros are at the cusps, because you can count the number there, and you know how many there should be total. So find that they're all at the cusps. So if I let dij be the divisor of phij, this is just some linear combination of cusps. And you know exactly what it is. If you look in Og's paper, he just has vectors of six numbers, and you just write them down. Now, the difference of any one of these two things is the divisor of the quotient, right? If I do I mean, dij minus dkl is the divisor of phi ij over phi kl. And this quotient is a meromorphic function on x, because it's the quotient of two modular forms of the same weight. And so that's zero in the Jacobian, because it's a principal divisor. So this gives you a bunch of linear relations between the cusps, right? You get all these equalities. And you just write them all down, and that gives you the theorem. So I just writes down a bunch of six vectors, and then manipulates them, and finds that 19 is times one of them is zero. So this gives us this big cyclic subgroup of the Jacobian, the Z mod 19 inside of it. And the next proposition is that's the full torsion subgroup. So the proof of this is pretty cool. So the first thing to do is uh, think about the points on the curve x over the finite field with four elements. So the only points on x over f4 are the six rational cusps. So it's clear that all those rational cusps are there, right? You can just reduce them and get them there. So, it, so no elliptic curve over F4 can have a point of order 13. Just by the Hasse bounds. So that means that the Y1 part doesn't contribute any rational points. And so the only other points that you could pick up are the other cusps. Right? There's these six other cusps, but you know their field of definition, and it just doesn't work at four. And so this means that the order of x over f2 is the same as the order of x over f4. Six. There's just six points in each one of them. And so now we use a lemma that I'll write over here. So suppose x over fq is a genus two curve. And J is a Jacobian. And you can relate the number of points on X to the number of points on J. And so the exact same as the number of points on J over FQ is minus Q plus one half the number of points on X over FQ squared plus one half the number of points on X over FQ quantity squared. So we'll come back to that in a second. But using that here, this implies that the number of points in the Jacobian over F2 is 19. All 
And so that means that if you look at this map from the torsion over Q, reduce mod 2, you know that the kernel of this is only 2 primary, right? There's only, you know, it's injective on the prime 2 torsion. So that means this theorem is correct up to 2 torsion, right? And now to deal with the two torsion, you do the same thing over characteristic three. So you show that uh, over F3, you only have the six rational cusps. And over F9, it turns out that you can have an elliptic curve over F9 that has a rational point of order 13. But there's only one such elliptic curve, and it has uh, an automorphism group of order six. And so the 12 different generators actually only give you two distinct points. So you only pick up two additional points. And again, this implies that the Jacobian has size 19. OK? So let me tell you how you prove this, but I won't do the details. So the point is that for both curves and abelian varieties, you can do point counting just if you know the representation on H1. And then it's just a linear algebra statement. So if you let V be the first the tau homology of X, let's say QL coefficients over FQ bar. So this has an action of Frobenius. And the number of points on X over FQ is 1 plus Q minus the trace of Frobenius in this representation. And the number of points over FQ squared is the same thing, but use Q squared and F squared. And the number of points in Jacobian is the sum from I equals 0 to 4 minus 1 to the I times the trace of F and the wedge power. Right, the general formula is you do the alternating sum of traces on cohomology. And the Jacobian, the cohomology is the wedge algebra on V. And here, this is the trace in H0, the trace in H2, and that's the trace in H1. And so now it's just a linear algebra thing. I mean, you have this guy F, oh, I guess you also have to use Poincaré duality. You know that the space V is self-dual up to Tate twist. So you have four eigenvalues, and they kind of multiply in pairs to Q. And you just show that these numbers work out to be the same. OK? Any questions so far? All right, and then there's one more result that I've proved that we need. I didn't actually think about the intelligent way to do that. I mean, you certainly could do it that way. There might be a better way to do it. OK, so this last thing is how the image of x intersects the torsion in j. The statement is that the image of X in the Jacobian, say on complex points, and here let's use the map, it takes P, the difference of P and one of the cusps, say P6. So the, this image meets the torsion points, the rational torsion, only at the six cusps. The six cusps are obviously in the image, and then there's 12 other points in, in the torsion group, and, oops, and 13 other points. So 19, so that's 19. The statement is that X misses those other points. And again, I'm just going to give the idea. Uh, so suppose that P minus P6 is in the torsion. The point then is that you know exactly what that group is. So that means that you can write P minus P6 as some multiple of, say, P1 minus P6. And so that means that if you do P minus NP1 plus N minus 1 P6, that's supposed to be the divisor of some function.
And then you just show that that can't happen unless this multiple is equal to pi minus p6 for some reason. Okay, but a, a corollary of this proposition We want to show that the rational points on x of q are just the six cusps. And so this says that we just have to check. I mean, it's enough to show that j of q has rank 0. Right? If j of q are rank 0, then the only rational points on j would be the six cusps. And then this would be saying that I mean, the image of any rational point on x would be a rational point on j. And this says that it would have to be one of those six cusps. So to prove the theorem. enough to show the rank of j of q is 0. So this is, yeah. Oh, I didn't say what it was. You have to think about what the functions are and the geometry of the situation and stuff. OK, so this is what Mazur and Tate actually do. They show that this Jacobian has rank 0. OK. So we'll start doing that. So first we need to know a little bit about the structure of this J. So the first thing is that it's a simple abelian variety. And the reason for this is easy. So suppose not. So suppose that you had some sequence. J1 and J2 are non-trivial, so then they're necessarily elliptic curves because J is two-dimensional. So J has a rational point of order 19, and so one of these two must, right? Because it either doesn't die here or it's in the kernel, which is there. So since J has Q point of order 19, so does J1 or J2. But an elliptic curve over Q can't have a Q point of order 19. Right? So we actually have already proved that in the course of Mazur's theorem. But in this situation, it's easier because you know that J has good reduction away from 13. So J1 and J2 do. And now you can just reduce, say, mod 2 over F2. And an elliptic curve can't have a point of order 19. So it, it's not that hard here. OK? All right, so note that uh, gamma 2 generates gamma. So remember, gamma was z mod 13 z star with plus or minus 1 killed. And so I'm just saying that 2 multiplicatively generates that group. So we're going to be using this gamma 2 quite a bit. So the order can't. That's going to be important throughout today. 13 is also prime, and that, that's important too. Um, all right. So the next statement is that uh, the action of gamma 2 on J satisfies the polynomial x squared minus x plus 1 equals 0. All right, so this follows from three observations. So first of all, uh, gamma 2 satisfies x to the 6 minus 1 equals 0, so it's order 6, uh, but not x to the d minus 1 equals 0 for d less than 6. So it's order exactly 6. Second observation is that if gamma 2 satisfies some polynomial, then it satisfies some irreducible factor of that polynomial. Yeah. 
And the reason for that is J is simple. Right? If, if you could write, if gamma 2 satisfied some non-irreducible polynomial and it didn't satisfy one of the pieces, then you'd have gamma 2 as a product of two non-zero things. I mean, you'd have a product of two non-zero things being zero, which would give you a decomposition of J. And then finally, you just look at the factorization of this thing. So x to the 6 minus 1 is x minus 1 times x plus 1 times x squared plus x plus 1 times x squared minus x plus 1. And each of these guys uh, divides x to the d minus 1 with d less than 6. So gamma 2 satisfies this, so it has to satisfy one of the factors, and it can't satisfy these three factors, so it has to satisfy that factor. Okay. Okay, so this means that uh, if you look at the ring Z gamma 2 modulo of that equation, which is isomorphic to the ring of cubic roots of 1, that this ring acts by endomorphism on, endomorphisms on J. And all these endomorphisms are defined over Q because gamma 2 is defined over Q. And in fact, uh, at least if you go up to the closure, or even just k plus, really. If you look at the group algebra of uh, this dihedral group delta, and you kill this equation, you get an action. And this thing is actually an order in a simple algebra. So if you tensor with q, this actually becomes isomorphic to matrices. That shows that this action is faithful because there's, you know, can't factor through anything. And it also shows that, I mean, if you think about J in the isogeny category over K plus, its endomorphism ring contains this empty Q, so that means it decomposes. So J is actually not simple over K plus. All right, so we don't actually need that, but that's just a side remark. So, you know, as before, when we were trying to show rank zero things, we did it by analyzing the torsion points of the Jacobian and the Galois cohomology and using Kummer theory, and that's what we're going to do here. And we're going to use the 19 torsion, because we know something about it, because we have this sub before 19. So we're going to analyze the module of 19 torsion points now. So I'm going to call that V. So that's the Q bar points of J19. So this is a four-dimensional vector space over the field with 19 elements. And it has an action of G and delta. And they act compatibly. So the subgroup gamma here commutes with G because it's defined over Q, but the gamma prime doesn't commute with G, so they mix somehow. So it, uh, the prime 19 splits in this ring. And so I'm going to write it as pi times pi bar. Or pi and pi bar are prime elements of that ring. And I'm going to let v sub pi be the kernel of pi on j, and v sub pi bar be the kernel of pi bar. And of course, v splits as v pi plus v pi bar. 
and each one of these spaces is stable by g and gamma. So. But they're moved around by the tails. So if you think in this in this ring where the tau's are, the conjugation conjugation by some tau zeta is going to induce the non-trivial Galois automorphism of this ring. And so conjugation by tau is going to flip pi and pi prime. So it's going to move the bees. All right. So the First thing I want to prove is that we have the V pairing on V, and the statement is that it induces a duality between V pi and V pi bar. Okay, so this V pairing, it's on the 19 torsion, it's a perfect pairing. And V splits is a direct sum of the two, these two spaces. And so to show that, I want to show that, you know, each is the dual of the other under this pairing. So it's enough to show that each one is, it's, is self-orthogonal. So uh, note that uh, if I have any x and y and v, so the pairing is, I mean, gamma 2 preserves the pairing, what I want to say, uh, just because it's an automorphism of the curve, and so it just comes from the functoriality of the Bay pairing. Now, gamma 2 acts on v pi by multiplication by some sixth root of unity. Right, because it's acting through the quotient of the ring it generates by pi, and so it's some element of the field F19 whose sixth power is one. A primitive sixth root of unity. And so, if you combine that with this, I mean, it says that if you have xy and v pi, then xy is equal to the pairing of gamma 2x and gamma 2y, and that's equal to zeta x zeta y, and so that's equal to zeta squared xy. And since zeta squared is not 1, this means that xy is 0. That shows that v pi is self orthogonal, and so v pi and v pi bar are Cartier dual, meaning the dual of one is the other up to a tape twist. All right, so now I'm going to define a few more subspaces of this v. So I'm going to let v of one be the, yeah. I think that might be okay. 
I mean, if you think about the one-dimensional case, you have like two vectors, and they both one squares to zero, then any other one is going to be a complement. Okay, so v of one is just going to be a rational portion. Right, that's a one-dimensional F19 vector space. And uh, since gamma acts on J over Q, it's going to preserve this. And so this V of 1 is stable by gamma 2. And so that implies that it has to be contained in V pi or V pi bar. gamma 2 is going to act by different sixth root of unities on these two spaces. So if it's stable by gamma 2, it has to be in one or the other. And so we're going to assume that it's inside of uh, v pi bar. OK. Uh, v of gamma is going to be the subspace of v consisting of elements V that satisfy the following. So I'll write it like this. So A times V is gamma of A times V for all A and gamma. Where here I'm identifying gamma with the Galois group of K plus over Q. Right, they're both Z mod 13, Z star mod plus or minus one. So I'm saying that the Galois action on V coincides with the action of this automorphism on V. And by the way that the Galois group acts on delta, it's easy to see that uh, in one of these tau zeta is, interchanges these two spaces. So gamma prime interchanges V1 and V gamma. And so that means that this V gamma is inside of V pi in one dimensional. And then finally, I'm going to let v chi be f19, just a one-dimensional space, with the Galois action given by the 19, mod 19 cyclotomic character. So uh, this inclusion of v1 into v pi bar if we use that in Cartier duality, right? if I take the dual of this, it turns into a surjection from v pi to v chi. So v1 injecting into v pi bar gives us v pi surjecting into v chi. statement that you'd want to be true now, you have this sequence, uh, v gamma sits inside of v pi, and v pi maps to v chi, and you'd like this to be exact, and it is. Okay, so this is easy to prove. I mean, this is an injection, this is a surjection. These are one-dimensional spaces, that's a two-dimensional space. So to make it exact, you just need to show the composite is zero. For that, it's enough to note that the action of the Galois group on V gamma factors through the Galois group of K plus and nothing smaller. And the action of G on V chi factors through the Galois group of Q adjoining the 19th roots of unity. 
and nothing smaller. And so that implies that these two guys are non-isomorphic. And so the composite has to be zero. So now we're going to get to the actual proof of rank zero. So here's the idea. To show that J of Q has rank zero, it's enough to show the map induced by pi is surjective. Uh, right? That's because you know, mordal Vey says that this is a finitely generated abelian group. And so if you think of it as a module over z join pi, then it's a finitely generated module over that dedicated domain. And so if some element's acting surjectively that's not a unit, then the thing has to be finite. So that's what we're going to show. And so we're going to do that by breaking it up into two steps. So consider this diagram. So now I'm thinking about J as living over Z join 1 over 13. So this map here is pi. And the co-kernel of that, well, it maps into the first cohomology, H1 FPPF, Z1 over 13. Right, this is a sequence that we've used before. And then you get the same sequence locally at 13. So JQ13 maps by pi to JQ13 maps to H1 over Q13 and J pi. And there's restriction maps like this. I'm going to call the right one rho. Okay, so we want this map here to be surjective. And so it's enough to show that this map here is surjective and this map is injective. Right, because if this, if this is surjective, then this map here is zero. So that means if you go down and over, you get zero. I mean, if you take any element here and you go down and over, you get zero. So if you go over and down, you get zero. And so if this is injective, that means if you take any element here and you go over, you get zero. So everything here comes from there. It's a simple diagram. So I'm going to call these statements one and two. So the statement one is that uh, pi is surjective on here. And statement two is that rho is injective. OK? So we're going to start with this statement that this is surjective. So I'm going to write, I'm going to try and write this cursive J for the Nerov model of J over Z13. I'm going to let N be the kernel of the reduction map. Sequence, 0 goes to n, goes to j, z13, goes to j, f13. I'm going to consider multiplication by pi on this sequence.
Okay, so pi divides 19, right? 19 is pi times pi bar, and n is pro 13. So that means that pi is an automorphism here. This is bijective because n is pro 13. Okay, so there's some lemma in diagrams. I think it might be the snake lemma. It says that you have some co kernel, co kernel, co kernel going to kernel, kernel, kernel going to co kernel, co kernel, co kernel. So the kernel and the co kernel of this guy are both zero. And so that means the kernel here is the same as the kernel of the co. Sorry, the two kernels are the same as the two co kernels. Okay. And we're trying to show that the co kernel of this pi is zero in the middle. That's what I mean, yes. The two kernels are isomorphic, the two co-kernels are isomorphic. Okay, so snake lemma says that the co-kernel of pi on jz13 is the co-kernel of pi on jf13. This is what we want to show is zero, right? So it's enough to show that this is zero. And now, this j of f13 is finite. And so that means that pi is surjective on it, if and only if it's injective. So to show that the co-kernel is zero is the same as to show that the kernel is zero. And now the snake lemma again says that the kernel of pi on j of f13 is the kernel of pi on jz13. So to show that this is zero, it's enough to show that this is zero. So we want to show that that last guy is zero. And note that the kernel of pi on j13 is the same thing as the q13 points of the kernel of pi. And this is the same thing as, I mean, the pi torsion in J is what we call V. So this is just the invariance of V under the decomposition group at 13. Right? So we're just trying to show that there's no invariance under this decomposition group. Okay, so now we use, sorry, this is v pi. Yeah. And so now we use our exact sequence that we have for v pi. So this v gamma goes to v pi, goes to v chi, goes to zero. So it's enough to show that the d invariants of the outside guys are zero. Okay, and so uh, V gamma is a faithful representation of the gamma group of K plus over Q. And the decomposition group at 13 is non-trivial there because 13 ramifies in K plus. So that means, I mean, each one of these is one dimensional representation. So we're just trying to show that that character is non trivial. And since there's a non trivial decomposition group, that means the character is non trivial. And I mean, similarly, this guy is a faithful representation of the Galois group of Q join the 19th roots of unity. And again, the decomposition group of 13 in this field is non trivial. 13 is not 1 mod 19. Right? All 
All right, so now we want to prove the second statement that this restriction maps on H1 is injective. So I want to begin with a proposition. Um, there is an exact sequence of group schemes over Z113. Uh, so J pi is in the middle that Sir Jackson from U19. And the kernel is something I call E. And the statement about this E is that this is a finite tau group scheme. And it becomes trivial over the field or the ring where I join the 13 roots of unity. Okay. All right. So the proof. Well, just take E to be the Zariski closure of V gamma in J pi. Right, the generic fiber of J pi is what we call V pi, and V gamma is some subspace of it. So you can think of that as a subgroup scheme of the generic fiber, and I'll just take the closure of that integrally. So that's some finite flat group scheme over this base. And we know that this Galois representation, V gamma, trivializes when I go up to this field. And so that implies by Renault's theorem that E trivializes over that extension as well. So we, we use Renault primarily locally, uh, right? So here I'm using Renault at the prime 19. These groups are of order 19. So away from 19, it's a tau, and the analog of Renault's theorem is easy. Uh, and then the point is, at 19, I mean, I'm adjoining a 13th root of 1. So there's no ramification. I'm introducing a 19. So that e less than p minus 1 hypothesis is OK. And so the quotient of e by j pi, j pi by e, rather, is generically this v chi. Which is, I mean, that's the Galois representation associated to mu 19. So again, Renault says that this thing is mu 19 over the base. So actually here we're only using Renault's theorem in a very special case when the things are like rank one vector spaces. And I think that statement was previously proved by Ort and Tate. I think maybe Renault's theorem wasn't even proved at the time of Maser Tate, so they appealed to Ort Tate. All right, so the statement that we needed to prove was something about restriction of the restriction map on H1 of this guy. And so we're going to break that into statements about the outer two things. That's the point of this proposition. So here's the diagram that we want to draw. So we're going to look at the sequence and cohomology related to this thing. So H1, we're working over Z join 113. Restrict this to Q13. This is the map that we called rho. I'm going to call this thing rho prime. So remember, what we're trying to prove is that rho is injective. So it's enough to show um, so I'll call it 2A that this guy is injective and what I'll call 2B 
that this group vanishes. So we'll start with the statement 2a, that rho prime is injective. All right, so the point is that we know exactly what these groups are. So what is this group? So this is the top rate group from over there. So what is this H1? How do you calculate H1 with coefficients in the UN? It's always the same way. Kumba theory. Yeah, so GM, F to GM multiplication by 19. The kernels mean 19, right? And so the, I guess the point is that uh, H1 of this thing with coefficients in GM is the Picard group of this scheme, which is trivial because it's a PID. So that goes away, and you just get the co kernels on the H0. So this is the group of units in Z1113 modulo its 19th powers. And then we have the target group, which is the same thing, but over Q13. This thing, well, it's the same thing. It's the units mod the 19th powers. And this map horizontally is the obvious map. And so this group here, I mean, Z 1 over 13 star, well, that's just the plus or minus the powers of 13. And minus 1 is 0, because minus 1 is the 19th power. So here you just have 13 to the n. That becomes a 19th power in Q13, then it's already a 19th power, right? You just look at the valuation. So that's why this is injective. So this is obviously injective. And that implies that rho prime is injective. All right, so the second thing we need to prove is that this group here is trivial. So we want this to be zero. So I can, this FPPF, I can just make a tau, because this is in a tau group scheme. And so it, this thing trivializes over this tau cover, right? I join the 13 groups of one. So by some version of like the inflation, restric inflation restriction sequence, I can take its H1 over this extension and then take Galois variance. point is that this extension of rings, C113 to when I join the 13th root of 1, that's a, an Natal extension of rings with Galois group, this group. So to do the H1 here, I can do it up there and then take invariance. And when I restrict E to that cover, we already know that it becomes trivial. So that's why it turns into the Z mod 19 Z. And so it, it's enough to show that the group without Galois invariance vanishes. Okay, but this group has a specific interpretation, a nice interpretation. Uh, does anyone know what this group means?
Yeah, but, I mean, you can say it in kind of even more elementary language. Um, I mean, it's Galois extensions of this field, which are unramified outside 13, that are abelian with group 19. Yeah. Um, I mean, H1 with coefficients in Z19 is the same as Hamm's from pi 1 to Z19. And the pi 1 is the maximal, is the Galois group of the maximal extension of this field unramified away from 13. Okay, so this H1 uh, the, the, I'll say captures uh, Galois or I'll say abelian extensions of the field K. That's the field adjoining 13 roots of unity. Abelian extensions of K of degree 19 which are unramified away from the prime over 13, which I'll call lambda. So it's enough to show that there's no extensions like that. So now this is in class field theory. Okay, so such extensions uh, are seen by the Ray class group with modulus lambda. Right? Indeed, everywhere unramified extensions correspond to the class group. And when you allow some ramification, that's when you use this Ray class group. And that fits into some short exact sequence. So you have the Ray class group, and that surjects into the class group. And the kernel is some quotient of the local unit group, for it only have one prime. And so this thing here, I'm taking the completion at 13, right? And so, uh, I mean, like the U1 group is pro 13, and the quotient is the units in the residue field, which is F13. So this group here, this is prime, the whole thing here is prime to 19. And then this thing is also, so it's just the fact that the class group, the 13th, whatever, I think that's actually class number one. The important point is that this is not divisible by 19. Okay, so that means there's no such extensions, and that completes the proof. Are there any questions? All right. So uh, I suppose next time, well, I haven't decided what we'll do. We might start doing some of this Kubert stuff. We still need to rule out. So okay, at this point, we've ruled out all the primes that we're supposed to have ruled out. But there's still more. Like We haven't ruled out 25 and 49 and things like that. So maybe I'll talk about that next time. Yeah, so this Mazur Tate paper is from like 73 and Mazur's paper is from 77 or 78. And then like 11 I think was done in the early 20th century. I think that was the first, the first one done. But I think, I think Mazur's argument we went through you? handled 11. Yeah, but it was done well before that. I, you'd have to ask Mazur that. I, I doubt it. I don't think he was wasting his time doing 13 when he could have done everything. But you can see kind of the elements that are coming into play. Yeah, yeah. No, but I imagine he did this and this was giving him some ideas about the general. Because you can see some of the same ideas. <laughs> well, in Ort's paper, that we're using, he mentions the Mazur Tate paper because I think it was done near the same time. And it sounds like he was crediting it to Mazur actually. Mazur has this descent technique that allows you to show these things. And so I, I mean, this you know, using the I, I think using this like flat cohomology and stuff is a new thing that Mazur. That's one of the key things in the other paper, right? The general case. So 
and you can see it building. I don't exactly know his motivation. Uh, I mean, so th this theorem that Mazur proved was actually a conjecture of Og. This, this, the thing about the possible torsion subgroups. So I think Og was like trying to figure that kind of stuff out. And I mean, he notes in his paper that uh, you know he 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 proved these theorems that we said. And, you know, the case of thirteen torsion, it's enough to show that the Jacobian has rank zero. And he says that in his paper. I mean, he was thinking about that. He showed that uh, BSD implied that. So on BSD, he showed that there was no 13 torsion, but he didn't have an unconditional proof. And he talked about some other cases as well, I think 25 and 18 or something. Uh, made similar remarks in that case. So I think he was like trying to prove this sort of thing. 